Shall we? Okay. As you wish. So, this is my daughter, Katarina. My name is Milos, um, and I'm one half. The other half, my wife, Slavica, is not here. And that's a bummer because she is an expert in some of the things I want to talk about today. So, you're in. <coughs> um, uh, I have a, uh, I hold a PhD in fine art and computing from the, Leeds of, uh, from the uh, University of Leeds. And at the moment, I'm uh, developing software that is uh, seeking to make use of some of the ideas that I will talk about. My wife, uh, she uh, has a PhD in uh, medieval and comparative literature from the University of Nottingham, and uh, she's now teaching at the University of Leeds, and uh, we collaborate on this project for some time. Uh, when she finished her PhD in 2006, she got this uh, offer a uh, wonderful, uh, prestigious research place, uh, uh, position um, at the uh, University of Bergen, Norway. How could we refuse? It was so, so wonderful. And, uh, uh, and so we packed our bags and uh, we went to Norway. And uh, uh, that year, there were torrential rains in, uh, during the summer in England. And, uh, uh, Really unusual rain, sudden, heavy, and caused um, um, uh, local flooding. At, at least, for example, in mean, Leeds, uh, within within uh, feels like seconds, probably within a few minutes of rain starting, half of my street was flooded. Okay, the same experience I had with the university when you see these old buildings, you know, suddenly water rising in the, uh, on the ground levels. You know. Very strange. You know, you, you're this. Familiar environment needed to transform. So we went to Bergen. Now, everybody told us that, uh, that Bergen is even more rainy. It's one of the rainiest towns in the world, yeah? So uh, we were lucky on the first day, it was gorgeous. And you know how, like, for example, in Scotland, when it's a gorgeous day, it's like heaven on earth, yeah? So, so that's how it was with, with Bergen, yeah? Uh, but it, well, it didn't last, it did start to rain, and then it rained for 70 days. And it's not five years old. And uh, uh, now, rain. You see, I thought that those were torrential rains in Leeds. Okay? I didn't know what that means. Okay? In Bergen, that's, it's, at, at, at times it feels like as if someone is pouring a bucket in there. Yeah? You can't fathom it. You know? How can a cloud pour back? You know? And uh, uh, the strange thing about it, no flooding. They actually, I heard of one flooding somewhere in the center, new building. New building flooded, okay? Then they did something to it and then they flooded again, yeah? Uh, and you have to, it's extraordinary to see these people going about their, their uh, uh, business as if nothing's going on, you know? You think it's, uh, it's whole, you know, the end of the world and they are just, you know, riding a bike for them, you know? And you can't see it through the water, yeah? <laughs> And uh, uh, of course, they, they all, it's normal to have this waterproof, uh, good quality water in a rich country. Water, uh, water, uh, waterproof uh, clothes. They say, they have this uh, expression, there is uh, no bad weather, just bad clothes. <laughs> and uh, what got my interest is that when I was uh, sloshing through that, uh, that alien world, uh, I, the, so the Bergen is, uh, Surrounded with fjords and, uh, and with seven mountains, spectacular landscape and cityscape, uh, and and so you have all. Most houses are on a slope of some mountain. Yeah, it's, you know, if you live somewhere, you're probably on the slope of some mountain, and uh, uh, and so there are these very steep, uh, steep uh, 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 streets. You know, uh, some new, some ancient, and during such rain, there will be there will be rivers going down. You know. Around the houses, around the cars, around the building, uh, 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 street furniture. And there is no flooding. This rain has this miraculous way of finding its way to the sea. And then I realized this, well I realized, it was obvious that 
burden is experienced when it comes to rain, whereas Leeds isn't. Is, doesn't have, is not an experienced cityscape when it comes to such rain. Yeah? And indeed, we have found something similar on, uh, on the Met Office website. That an important aspect of the impact assessment, if they are talking about severe weather warnings, okay? So they need to assess the severe, stop reading, I'm going to read. So they, they are this studying this, uh, uh, what, do, what do we do, how do we assess how dangerous uh, potentially weather can be, okay? So with respect to that, they say an important aspect of the impact assessment is that the same weather may have different levels of impact in different parts of the UK. For example, wind gusts of 60 miles per hour may have virtually no impact in northwest Scotland, where strong winds are common, but have a much higher impact in south, uh, southeast England, where there are rare kind of situations, etc. Yeah. So it is interesting that that uh, a cityscape that. Uh, people, uh, ways of being, can get experience of, uh, for a particular kind of weather. And this experience is somehow carved into that landscape, into that city. It's in the shapes. It's not some wise person knowing it. It's, it the wisdom is in the town, in the, in the layout, in the way things are, in the stones, in the buildings, little solutions, that, uh, ways of living under such weather, that accumulated over the years, centuries. So I was interested how how this rain is shaping both the culture of that environment and the physical uh, 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 and, and nature, um, both by sedimentation and erosion. Yeah, it's adding and taking away. Okay, and over time. The, the mountain, for example, learns about the rain, learns how to most efficiently to, to channel it to the sea. But, and when the rain falls, the, the mountain remembers it. Ah, I know you. You go this way. Okay? Into myriad detailed uh, nooks and crannies. And so, a great deal of knowledge. Um, but it is in the physical shape, it's in the shapes. At the same time, as rain finds itself channeled by that ancient knowledge, it also carves it, yeah? Just by, by uh, 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 recapitulating this, this uh, pattern of trickling down to the sea in a specific way that it does on that particular mountain, it also carves it, it changes it, okay? This is what I'm, uh, uh, an important metaphor for me throughout this lecture. A notion of memory that is not really about storage and retrieval. It's about living memory, the kind that uh, neuroscientists are talking about, uh, where, or, or for example, in some of the uh, recent uh, continental philosophy, where Ingo Derrida was talking about that kind of uh, 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 memory, where there is this dual notion of the trace. There is the trace that is, that is like a medium, that is in the shapes, and then there is the trace. That, that is the pattern of trickling down the mountain, okay? And one cannot be without the other. Like a domino and domino effect. You can't have domino without, uh, you can't have domino effect without the domino. It, it, you know, you can't, one cannot, they come together. Now, while I was on the slopes of the, of the Bergen, uh, one of the Bergen mountains, we had a, we were renting a lovely house. And it had a lovely garden. And had, everything was really lovely including the view, except that every now and then I have to cut the grass, okay? And I noticed something about my lawnmower. In order to use it, I have to squeeze both of my hands when, when I'm holding the, the, the hand, yeah? It has a, a mechanism that is called a dead man switch, okay? What that means is that if I let go of one hand, the engine stops. Okay? So this design of this little machine is looking after me. It's protecting me from my own stupidity. Okay? So I was interested in that. How somebody is worried about me. Yeah? And why? What's the motivation? Why is it there? Okay? Well, there are two interesting answers. There are many. But there are two interesting answers that's kind of one of them rather kind of bizarre and shocking. It's there because people do that to themselves. 
Yeah? They cut themselves with, with their own lawnmower. It's a really popular way of, of hurting yourself. Uh, 60,000 people in the United States a year decide to trim their limbs that way. And uh, uh, so you can think of this little design feature as being very experienced. Yeah? It's not there, it's, you know, it didn't come up just so. Yeah? It took uh, 60,000 people cutting themselves every year to force this and this solution there. Okay? It indexes, you know, I, I, don't, I don't dare, you know, coming up with an image in my head, you know. It, it, it reminded me of something of this diamond campaign, uh, blood diamond campaigns. You know, you, you must have seen that there's a movie now about it as well. Uh, you know, so if they're trying to make you aware, hey, you, you get a, a diamond, watch out, uh, uh, be aware of what, what is the history, what is, what, how, what is the experience of that diamond, yeah? And the experience is bloody, it's, uh, it, it's source, it's, uh, it's a method of production involves a great deal of suffering. Luckily, it's out of your view, you don't see it, so that's okay, you just look at your finger, it shines. But this, these kinds of campaigns, like, like uh, in the 80s, there was this uh, anti fur campaign, yeah? So again, they were trying to, I'm not particularly highlighting this, uh, these, two, uh, uh, these two posters, uh, this was actually an award-winning uh, video. Um, uh, specifically, it was just easy to find on the internet. It's just an example of trying of someone trying to make you aware of the history of the object. Okay, so the next time you see it, even without blood, that you sort of see the blood, that, it's, that there's a residue of of that. You, it stays with you. So, uh, what I'm saying is not particularly interesting in, in its own right. I mean, everything has history. Surrounded. On my way to, to Little Hall, I passed through, through obviously from the train station to, to the Cambridge area. So, I don't know, a thousand uh, aspiring uh, young adults, fledgling intellectuals. And that, that's really delightful. I, I felt like a Methuselah, you know, given the average age of the town. And uh, 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 at the same time, this, this, uh, growing of intellectual minds in this town takes place nested in these ancient <coughs> buildings, ancient <coughs> buildings, which are similarly dripping with, with ancient <coughs> blood, uh, the way the, that fur does. Coming to a little bit of lighter, lighter uh, topic. Uh, uh, this reminded this long more fair, uh, thing reminded me of uh, something about Wimbledon, the honest. I don't have such a specialized lawnmower myself. This is the guy doing the, the uh, mowing the, the Wimbledon uh, court. And uh, I don't know if you, if you know, but it really takes a lot of effort to produce this such a high quality court. And uh, uh, 15 months they work on this particular patch of grass so that it is ready for them. Okay? And it's beautiful on the first day. Absolutely gorgeous. You can sense 15 months in it, yeah? And so, during the least important games, the pitch is in its best state. <laughs> during the most uh, important games, it is in its worst state. Here it is at the uh, Wimbledon final this year. Okay, this is Joe Bridge and Federer. I looked 10 years earlier. This is Federer still. <laughs> and Rodek. And, uh, and, uh, there is the pitch. But I was interested in these patches of wear, these patterns of wear. I was thinking, tennis changed in this period. This is Corners uh, 94. This is uh, 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 Everett, Chris Everett, 1984. And that's way beyond. Uh, my <laughs> memory, I was too little, so this is uh, some dudes as the uh, final in 1974. Uh, and I was interested in these patterns of wear, so I put them in, uh, 
Photoshop tried to make them uh, as equal to each other as possible. And I noticed, I don't know if you can see, the flash here in 1974 is very evenly distributed across the board. And as if over the coming decades, somebody is sucking it in, in this pattern towards the center. <laughs> Where did the pen go? Where did the plate? Yeah? In fact, about this time, metal records were invented. Okay? So some people were still playing here in, in the final. The wooden records, some were adopting metal records, they were not so good, but they were improving, the ball was getting faster. To reach it, you have to be more athletic, more athletic, more faster. Oh, science of art, science of dance. Now we have scientists involved in that. And now these are, these are uh, cyborgs playing tennis. <laughs> and uh, and it, it's called, they are playing table tennis. It's completely outside the, the point. You see that, you know, I was, for a moment I was thinking maybe the grass is better, but no, the hair is horrific here. There is no grass at all, you know? Well, can you imagine how these people who make this grass, how could they hate each other? And, 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 and so, the, so the, uh, the tennis is outside the court. But of course there is a much better example of tear when it comes to grass. You see that I'm constantly talking about memory about how things remember, okay? But here, I didn't like this example with Wimbledon because the tear didn't influence the game back, okay? But there is an example that is well known to all of us of graphs that does influence your behavior back, okay? So you pause it by walking on graphs, and then what you pause causes back changes in your behavior. And this caught uh, an eye of some philosophers, one of them, all the lines of desire the lines. And, but you know it is maybe as a beaten path. Yeah? Desire path. This is probably <coughs> particularly popular with the bicycle, cutting the corner, it's very thin path. This is just going around the obstacle. Some of you brilliant people that have to solve the problem. <laughs> um, this, is, this is revealing from the bird's eye perspective, you can see a very dodgy practice of many people of crossing the crossing the rail uh, railroad. And how many of these are kids that are doing that? You know, this is just waiting for an accident. But it's interesting, you know, why are there two? Why is there this little little uh, uh, curve there? Of course, we can't tell because we are. We are so if we were there, we, we might feel some of it, maybe we wouldn't. Yeah, it's, a, it's a gather of wisdom of many people leaving their trace. And then this trace where you're walking, you're usually thinking about dinner or something else. So you're not thinking about the path, you're following it. Okay? You're following the beaten path. It's guiding you. Okay? But as, you got, as, as you're following it, you're also creating it. You're perpetuating it. Perpetuating it. You're also changing it. And if you stop doing it, and if everybody stops doing it, the grass will grow and it will disappear. Yeah? This is a really good metaphor for the way that our brains work, people discover. That uh, use it or lose it principle, otherwise known as Hegel. This is uh, Michigan State University. Uh, usually, these uh, desire paths. Uh, counter official uh, uh, decisions about which way people want to go. But this went the other way around. This is the, the university decided to, to put the path, uh, the, to pay uh, uh, where the uh, uh, desired paths were showing. Okay, there's another view. I love this detail here. You see these are all paid, except this one. You can't pay it, it's going straight across a, 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 a football pitch, a American football pitch. So this, this memory that is in the environment is a very interesting thing. You remember to walk a certain way. Imagine you go this path, you take this path every day to your work, you know. You sort of remember, but how much do you need to remember inside your head? The path remembers for you. 
This is the kind of remember you like. There are some people who, for example, vacuum their house every Tuesday or whatever, you know. Uh, but I, so many people, we wait for the house to tell us, I'm dirty, vacuum it, yeah? You don't have to remember, the house does the work of counting the days of dust settling in. Yeah? And um, so this is a, a kind of memory that people, scientists discovered, and for psychologists, uh, psychologists and, and uh, it was a gestalt era, and so they figured out that, that indeed uh, there are all these, that all these objects have their affordances, spaces have affordances, and, and you're still guided by these things. What is interesting to me is that this memory isn't necessarily in your brain. The way you don't, for example, need to remember explicitly gravity, you are that way so that gravity makes sense for you. So you, every part of your shape is informed by gravity. And um, ah, I yeah. um, so certainly I'm not the only one who thinks about the you know the city doing some magical work. You know, uh, it's it's been there are many movies, for example, that have a sort of a love affair with the, with the city. You know, they they show uh, life of the city in some way. Ways. And this, this is a <coughs> restaurant on top of the World Trade Center at the end of the 1970s. It's about the time that a uh, French philosopher, whom I didn't know until recently, uh, he, he got up there, was much impressed, and added his impressions to the book he was writing, The Practice of Everyday Life. And now you're going to hear my French. Michel de Sartou. How about that? Sartou. Poor guy. He said something very interesting. The act of walking is to the urban system what the speech act is to the language. This is perhaps of some interest to uh, performance artists who are interested in environment in the space. But here there is a conceptual environment that is the language that you're using. Yeah? It guides your behavior. It provides the vocabulary that, that is available to you to express yourself as an urbanite. Yeah? Uh, in the same way as a language provides means of expressing yourself. Okay? But each time you do so, you're also carving new patterns in the language, new ways of doing so. I have to read this passage, I'm just uh, 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 fell in love with it. It really uh, captures various features that I've, that I've talked about so far, so far uh, in terms of the city. Okay? But there is implication also for language. The ordinary practitioners of the city live, live down below, below the thresholds at which visibility begins. They walk an elementary form of this experience of the city. They are walkers whose bodies follow the, trip, the thick and thins of an urban text they write without being able to read it. These practitioners make, make use of spaces that cannot be seen. Their knowledge of them is as blind as that of lovers in each other's arms. I particularly like this metaphor of the lovers, uh, a lover's blindness. Okay? Their embrace is a form of blindness. Really, literally, you know? You have someone and your distance that gives view disappears. Yeah? Intimacy is a form of blindness. This is what, in a way, Derrida, uh, Jacques Derrida, uh, famous or, depending on your point of view, infamous philosopher, uh, said in his appointment in his last interview, he said, uh, confessed really, even, even the most, uh, the most wonderful events of my life were things of sadness. I was aware that they are, even as they are happening there, they are disappearing and cannot happen. Okay? Or, in as much as they happen, they are memory. They are kind of, uh, they are a loss of themselves. Yeah? And a similar but more kind of theoretical point was made by, I think, Heidegger, maybe Marla Conti, I'm sorry. Um, he said, uh, one of them, said uh, that light is necessary to. Vision, yeah? Without light, there is no vision. And yet, 
light itself must disappear for vision to occur. Okay? If you see light itself, then you're blinded, you don't see. Yeah? So this projector, for example, is blinding me because it's, I'm seeing the light, and therefore I'm blinded, I do not see. Okay? So this is an interesting thing. Now, the city dweller, in order to participate intimately in the light down there, he says down there, he's, he's up, up there at the top of the World Trade Center, they're down there, and uh, in order to participate in the intimacy of, of committed life, their vision disappears, their distance. I suppose matter, the philosophical distance that he has from that perspective. The paths that correspond in this intertwining, unrecognized points in which every, each body is an el uh, element signed by many others, elude legibility. It is, we'll come to that in a moment, that, that, that each element is signed by many, that it is kind of distributed authorship at play, at, at play here, yeah? But that that itself causes a certain loss of legibility. It is as though the practices organizing the bustling city were characterized, like, characterized by their blindness. The networks of these moving, intersecting writings compose a manifold story that has neither author nor spectator, shaped out of fragments of trajectories and alterations of spaces. In relation to representations, it remains daily and indefinitely other. In my other work, which I don't have time to go into, I refer to this as a distinction between the bulk and the conspicuous. The bulk is the bulk of, it, of, what going, of the going on, okay? but to which we are blind. Yeah? And the conspicuous is that which allows the spectacle that we are aware of. Okay? But for it to exist, uh, it's like a surf on the surface of the, of, of the ocean. It, it unfairly attracts all the attention. Yeah? Whereas it takes a tsunami to remind, for us to be reminded where the bulk of it is. Escaping the imaginary totalization produced by the eye, the everyday has a certain strangeness that does not surface, or whose surface is only its upper limit, outlining itself against the visible. So this is uh, poetic philosophical language, but uh, I think what he's talking about here is that all relationships require interface. Yeah? Interestingly, uh, in various disciplines in the past century, people started to discover that when you look for essence, for content, you don't find it, you just find a lot more interfaces. Huh? Rustling, bustling city. I'm going to use this uh, uh, scene, rather inspired scene from, from How I Met Your Mother, did anybody watch this series? Do, do, do you know what this is? Anybody? Raise your hand if you watch this series. There you go. Okay, you're my friends. So it's a, it's, a, it's a lovely way of passing your time. And uh, season four, episode 23, this is Ted and Stella talking. Uh, they were engaged. She left him at the altar maybe a year or more ago. Please correct me if I'm wrong about this. And, uh, and uh, so now they are in, in the same car. It is as uncomfortable as you can imagine. And uh, uh, she, in fact, is now married to Tony. Ted, witheringly single, interrupting himself with bottomless sighs. Okay, I'm going to say something out loud that I've been doing a pretty good job of not saying out loud lately. What you and Tony have, what I thought for a second you and I have, what I know that Marshall and Lily have, I want that. I do. Kept waiting for it to happen and I'm waiting for it to happen and I guess I'm just I'm tired of waiting. And that is all I'm going to say on that subject. A few seconds of compassionate silence later, Stella breaks with a jolly tone. You know, I once talked my way out of a speeding ticket. Really? I was heading upstate to my parents' house doing like 90 on this country road and uh, uh, I got pulled over. So there was this cop who get, uh, get out of his car, he kind of swaggers over, and he's like, young lady, I have been waiting for you all day. So I looked up and I said, I'm so sorry, officer, I got here as fast as I could. 
Momentarily, Ted's somber appearance cautiously lights up. For real? Nah, it's an old joke. Ted deflated. Stella is kidding with him again, just as she did with their wedding, uh, leaving him for Tony, uh, sinks back into his moods. Stella goes on revealing her meaning. I know that you are tired of waiting, and you may have to wait a little while, a little while more, but she's on her way, Ted, and she's getting here as fast as she can. As no further words seem to do justice to what was just said and meant, they exchange a tender look of reciprocated appreciation and unconditional reconciliation. Bye, Stella. Goodbye, Ted. She promised Ted something. Exactly what he wants. I don't know if you read the uh, exit a, a little prince. Yeah? The prince says, draw me a sheep. The pilot in the desert draws the little prince a sheep. I don't like that sheep. She tries again. It's too old too decrepit, whatever, bad sheep. Finally, the, 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 the pilot draws a box with few little holes. Actually, I think holes from late. So he draws a little box and he says, here, this is your sheep. And the little prince, to his surprise, says, that's it, that's exactly the sheep I wanted. Yes, and good that you drew a house for her. You know, here on the desert it can be quite dangerous. So, Stella promises Ted, a box, perfect girl, she is in there, yeah? In fact, she's not even in a box, she's out there and she's racing towards him as fast as she can. But I was interested in this, who promised this exactly? Was it really her that promised it? Is she going to pop the girl out of thin air? Or did she reveal something, some wisdom? To Ted, that, or, or maybe just reminded him that good things come to those who wait or who know how to wait well. What if there is someone telling her, her, that other girl, that Ted is coming to her, to her as fast as he can? Okay? I'm interested in the sense in, this, in which this is true. I don't know if you want to go on with this, and I don't have time too much to uh, go deep into it, but in fact that is an intuition about the second law of thermodynamics. It's a very unfortunate name because second law of thermodynamics is the first principle of science. Okay? Basically, it means she comes as, as soon as she can. The future is coming to you as soon as If something is in its way, then we no longer have explanations. Something else played a part. Okay? So in a way, they're talking about chance, and a particular conception of chance in this particular series, about the chance as a certain kind of hard work of the city, rustling, bustling city, yeah? pushing them towards each other and so that they achieve moving towards him, maybe him to her as well, as fast as he can. Wislava Szymborska, a Nobel laureate in literature, at the age of 70, wrote a poem about this, about love at first sight. She was interested in the notion of the first. So, she wrote about lovers convinced that a sudden passion joined them. They'd be amazed to hear that chance had been toying with them now for years, not quite ready yet to become their destiny, pushed them close, drove them apart, it barred their path, stifling a laugh, and then left aside. There were signals and uh, signs and signals, even if they couldn't read them yet. Perhaps three years ago, or just last Tuesday, a certain leaf fluttered from one shoulder to another. Something was dropped and then picked up. Who knows, maybe the ball that vanished into childhood cricket, there were doorknobs and doorbells where one touch had covered another before. I like that. She imagine, imagines these circuits, these circuitry paths that they were making through the town as they were going about their business. These circuits, because they repeated uh, themselves. He goes to work, he comes back to work, he goes to theater, it's always 
the same period, and so on. There are certain paths he makes to the by yogurt and so on. And these paths were many times overlapping. They were missing each other like that much. And how would you visualize that? Yeah? That the work of the rustling, bustling city doing all, all that uh, preparation, that all that chancing. And uh, the guys who were developing how much uh, your mother had a brilliant idea. Yeah? Instead of doorknobs, they had a yellow umbrella. And throughout the series, those who watched know that we were much intrigued by this yellow umbrella that changed soft hands between the mysterious girl that will in future uh, be the mother, how I met mother, that mother, and, uh, uh, and, and she, first she owned it, she lost it, he found it, he lost it, she found it, or something like that. So with Slava, uh, she was, uh, 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 she concludes, every beginning is only a sequel after all, and the book of events is always open halfway through. Something about the temporality of a network. Network of relations. Something about temporality was much on the nerves of many philosophers and scientists of the 20th century. In this town, this temporality is not strange at all. You find ancient and fledgling all around. This is an extreme example. This is a Planck satellite. And it was developed for one specific extraordinary purpose. It was developed to take a photograph of the baby universe, the way the universe was when it was a fraction of its current age, less than 300,000 years old. At that time, the universe was so dense, because it was much smaller, and all this matter had to fit in that space, that it was equivalent to a sun, basically. It was a plasma. It was not see-through. We know that sun shines because there is vacuum between us, well, speaking of vacuum between us and the sun. Okay, but inside the sun, we there is no, it's not see-through. And in fact, when you walked out into the open day, uh, into, the, into the morning day, to this morning, this, uh, when you walked out <laughs> this morning, <coughs> there was a photon that just arrived from the sun. And you would think it's eight minutes old, because that's how long it takes to travel from the sun. But no, it's more likely to be millions of years old. Yeah? The light that falls upon us is ancient, because it takes these photons that much time to bubble up to the surface of the sun. Once they're there, it takes them eight minutes to get there. But here, we're talking about the whole universe being in plasma like that. And then at one relatively short period in its uh, evolution, it got big enough and therefore sparse enough for it to cool enough so that atoms can form and suddenly it became see-through. At that moment, the photons that were around in, inside that plasma got free and they flew every which way. Okay? And we can still see those photons. We are very interested in them because they tell us about the distribution of matter at that time. So that mo motivated uh, uh, European Space Agency to make this extraordinary instrument. The way I like to think about it is that this coincidence of now and the ancient, yeah? it is now that this instrument is moved by the death of the photon that was born with the, uh, with the birth of the universe. All along you notice that I'm talking about different kinds of habits. Here's an example. Maybe our philosopher got off uh, trade center and, and uh, infused by his philosophical thinking, wanted to get intimate with the New Yorker. And what would happen? This French dude would come, and as he offers the hand, the other hand comes to meet him. It's an extraordinary little thing that we do very often, okay? Imagine I offer someone a hand, and then there's a pause, aha, uh -huh, let's shake hands, then the other hand. It would actually be rude. Very often, it's like, uh, 
how do you call it, Wild West, uh, how do you call it, uh, when they are drawing guns, yeah? So it's actually so fast that we draw hand to shape, you know, at, at just a fraction of the, of the second we recognize the intent. Yeah. And it feels to us at that moment that it is happening at that moment. It feels to us that this is something intimate between me and this other person, okay? But is that all there is to it? How did this person know? Maybe I never met him. How did he know how to respond to my handshaking gesture? Okay? How something inside him recognized the handshaking gesture? What was that? Something in me recognized his handshaking gesture. What was that? Okay, well, I had parents, they were teaching me how to be a nice boy. I met uh, people in my environment, so lots of people shaking hands. That's how I learned. Well, he did too. But this this bulk of our environment, yeah, the deeper you look into the influences, the more you become aware that this is the same bulk, comes from the same place. In fact, a shape, shaking hands is an ancient habit, which is very good at rejuvenating itself, and it is like a circuit. And at that point, when I shook hands, it is not simply that I met him, but the, the handshake shook hands with itself. A certain circuit was closed, and when it did, it got stronger. It is like our little pathways in the grass, the, the, this, this, uh, the, the pathways of uh, uh, desire paths. Yeah? If nobody walks that walk, it disappears. If people walk, it continues to exist. If people continue to shake hands, shaking hands exists. Stop, it disappears. Okay? Walking the walk through all the relationships from childhood when we start learning all the way to, well, to the other end. This reminds me of marriage. My wife and I are particularly good at arguing. It's an art. Okay? We do it, I think we should once record it beautifully. Okay? Uh, but one thing that an argument between, or between a married couple is such an important part of popular culture. Yeah? It's everywhere, yeah? in movies and in, in theater. And I wish when I see someone arguing with a young couple in, in the park, yeah. I wish I could come to them, obviously they would talk with but if, if I come to them and I could, if I could show them if I could zoom out their perspective, and they at that moment saw thousands of other couples around the globe doing the exactly the same thing. To them it feels like this is something uniquely theirs, something private, something, something intimate between her and him and, or in other combinations. And what a change in perspective would it be if, if they saw that they are doing that they are participating in a vast effort for the community of men and women to figure out gender. One of the toughest problems that I don't see even on a horizon that will soon, sooner know some mysteries of the cosmos than that one. <laughs> for a very important reason, because there is no solution. Yeah? We can discover uh, uh, laws of physics, but we have to invent laws of gender relation. So, number one is another habit. It's a different one. This one is really stable. You know, when I was little, they tried, started to teach me, you know, I can't even remember it then. It's so, uh, you know, baby is this big and you already, you know, one this, one that. And very soon you learn to clutch all but one finger. Yeah? And you know what that means. And you continue to selectively clutch all the fingers but one throughout your life, all the way up to that maybe last day, when with a last gesture perhaps you want that one more thing. And think of that. Euthanasia is another habit. It's a habit of thought, habit of legal practice in some places. It's ancient as well. Yeah? 
the, the need for that is, is as old as compassion. But this one is slightly different. I do not know exactly how to orient myself towards it. It's a difficult one. Yeah? I don't feel I quite figured it out. And I think I'm not the only one. Notice that I can be sure that it should be legalized or not legalized. I can be confident about my decision. But to hold that decision is expensive. Yeah? Even if I am certain, I've made up my mind, I need to be aware of all the things that don't fit into my decision. Yeah? Thank you. Still today, in many countries, have uh, this institutionalized this method of publishing. Very complicated one. Yeah? And a witness to that is a lot of popular culture that surrounds it. Yeah? It is as if these things, the more we find it ambiguous as to what we're supposed to do, the more we are culturally interested, the more there are cultural problems, the more there is cultural communal attention around such an issue. Sounds normal, doesn't it? So there are many movies that deal with that phenomenon. For example, in the United States, you know, there's these difficult, impossible questions. Okay? Maybe we should kill people as a punishment because that's the way to protect the, 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 the public. Yeah? Maybe they are incurably bad people. Yeah? Well, and then you start to worry that the best method is that the only method of, of protecting the, the, the public. Maybe there is, uh, the reason is that uh, uh, it's a deterrent. Okay? But when you go into the details, whether it works or not, it's not so clear that it's a deterrent it works. Maybe, maybe it should be, it should be performed as a way of revenge. After all, it must be difficult for a family who have lost loved one in a violent way to know at any point in time, continuously, there is this person who caused them this utmost grief and he is somewhere there, you know, enjoying facilities of his body still, whereas their child or whoever uh, no longer does. This is a part that I'm going to skim over a whole lot of this. Artists generate variation, we can say. Yeah? They are on each other's face, you know. I made this, so that's my variation, and you do something else. And uh, so artists generate variation, maybe we can say that. But there is a rule to that. Okay? There are ways of doing that. Okay? Gen generating variation randomly has no chance of success. You can see that most spectacularly, perhaps, in the uh, practice of jazz, jazz pianists. Okay? They are capable of composing while they're playing. Yeah? Improvisation. But when you start analyzing what they do, you see that they use certain kind of formulas. This is a term that was borrowed from, uh, from the um, uh, from, uh, literary studies of ancient texts. Formulas. So there are these flourishes that, that they can, they, that are higher level structures that they become their vocabulary and they can express themselves on this higher level. You know. And the best of them have several levels of, of those uh, formulas available to them. So my wife and I, well, this is, uh, my wife's specialism is uh, sagas of Icelanders. And why? Because they're spectacular case. They, they are particularly uh, a, a wonderful resource when you want to study the use of formulas uh, uh, by, uh, in, uh, in field of practice. So a formula is a habit of, uh, 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 any habit of creative petition, a habit of creative practice. So uh, I'm going to skip this because this is uh, telling you why sagas are great. So these are some important people saying that they are phenomenal. And uh, uh, one of the reasons that, that uh, they indeed uh, would anytime recommend uh, uh, reading them, they are actually up to date. 
Yeah, you read them and it's un unfathomable. How, how is it that this text has such command over, over attention still after you know, so many centuries? And uh, one of the reasons why this te these texts are so fascinating is because they, uh, they come from a, a group of people that have unwittingly performed a kind of uh, human experiment yeah, on a very large scale. So they, they, uh, uh, the, the sagas are stories of settlement to Iceland. Oh, let me just ask you, would you like some rest? Are you sure? Yeah, the few people are more involved. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, so if, if you like, we can take a few minutes of, of you, if you like, you can continue, yeah? Okay. So, so this, uh, a group of Norwegians decided to move from Norway. They didn't want to, uh, uh, um, to the, the king of Norway decided to unite all the uh, lords into one, into, into centralized power. And uh, a large group of them did not like that idea. So they decided to move to Iceland. And uh, so they did, and in that move, the nature of the move prevented them from even considering replacing the problem there with another centralized source of power. Yeah? So for, for a very long time, people in Iceland, after moving, this was nine, end of 9th century, beginning of 10th century, long ago, they, they moved in, into this island and, uh, and lived in a kind of strange de de democracy. Yeah? Not only did they all have to decide things in a, uh, uh, in a uh, for example, annually they would meet yeah, across Iceland, they would meet in, in one place, and they had a phenomenal name for that meeting. It was called the thing. Okay? So they meet at the thing, and then they decide what to do about stuff. You know, they also deal with legal issues at that point that arose in, in the meantime. So they, for a long time, did not have centralized power. And yet, they brought with them a very refined sense of legal, uh, uh, legal practice. Yeah? So, it was, this was a strange situation in which you have a very sophisticated uh, uh, legal awareness and, and, and tradition. And on the other hand, there is no uh, uh, organ of in law enforcement. Yeah? What that in practice means is that if somebody does you wrong, it's up to you to revenge yourself. However, it must be clear why you're doing that. You must be doing that because it is social justice to do so. Yeah? You are doing that because you are wrong, but you are also sanctioned by the community to pursue that punishment, whatever that may be, usually killing a guy, uh, um, uh, because, uh, because this is social, social good, not because this is uh, 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 governed by personal passions. Okay? But how do you dis disconnect these two things? This is coinciding with the same person. Okay? Now, if somebody hurts my child, okay, how much do I think about social justice? Okay? What fuels my, my, uh, my actions? So, how to deal with that? They had a phenomenal and unique solution to that. They don't do anything. Yeah? And this became a great um, aesthetic or a virtue of, a, of, of this heroic uh, uh, nation, of the heroic uh, culture. So if you are wronged, at that very moment when you find out or this is done to you, you don't do anything. Yeah? So you have here And some examples. So throughout sagas, there are cases that, that, that you, where you can see this in action. Vermund had a grown-up daughter to whom Hali soon took a liking. He spent much time talking to her, and rumors of this soon spread. Vermund learned about them, but acted as if he knew nothing. Acted as if he knew nothing. A little later, this is another saga. A little later in the summer, Glam came out of uh, out to Iceland and after staying briefly with his ship, went to his farm with a lot of wealth. 
but he had the same nature as before, re uh, reacting little and behaving as though he had not heard what had happened out here in the meantime. So again, he doesn't react. Now keep in mind that with all these examples, the wrongdoers were killed by those same people. Okay? What I mean is that they just don't do it then. Yeah? They are supposed to do it in a calculated fashion. It doesn't work in this in a society like that. It's toxic terribly, but it solves a beautiful solve their problem. Okay? And it fed into the aesthetics of behavior. You're, you know, you, this is an honorable thing to do, a heroic thing to do, to, to, to keep your temper in check. She took no notice at first, but she was silent. One morning, Helgi asked his mother what was the matter with her. She told the brothers, her sons, the slanderous remark that so first she shows no reaction. But then she told the brothers, her sons, the slanderous remark that Tor had made about her, and you, uh, and you too will avenge neither uh, this dishonor nor any other, even though it's done to me, she added. They acted as if they did not hear what she said. I mean, you can see how important this is, that, you know, it's spaced by, uh, by, uh, by a paragraph, upon, uh, uh, first the mother and then her two sons show this hero heroic restraint of temperament. Of course, they killed the dad. <laughs> ah, sorry. Now, there is a story, a phenomenal story, a saga of great and strong, okay? Where he's very strong, and from, uh, from, from young age, he shows great promise, you know, intelligence and strength and so on. But nasty temperament. And throughout the, throughout the saga, uh, uh, and this is a novel length saga, throughout the saga, uh, everybody describes him as tempestuous, you know. He can't help, you know, keep his temper. Yeah. And even he himself describes uh, himself as such, okay? Now, this is a saga of the strong, on the face of this, and given that this is the aesthetics, is to actually, actually keep the temper, you would say that the greater must be a villain, you know, he is, you know, despised by this nation. Strangely enough, you see the, the, uh, uh, the 19th century Islamic poet who authored their anthem, he says in a verse, you greater are my nation. How can that be? It doesn't compute. Yeah? Everywhere throughout the corpus of the sagas, all those many sagas, you see this formula. They, they behaved as if nothing happened. He reacted as nothing happened. He didn't see anything. Now you see here uh, someone who is said to lose their temper all the time. Why is he my name? You know, my name. What, a, what an accolade, the, 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 the actual. And this pride continues, you know. Icelanders are proud of Greater still, and so this is the uh, National Geographic ma ma magazine is uh, describing Greater as medieval Jesse James, you know. Uh, and uh, the story of him and where he traveled across Iceland, this is the best way to, 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 to find out about Iceland. So what on earth is going on? How can how can uh, uh, Icelanders love Greater, who does something opposite of what is sanctioned by the community, what is uh, what is genuinely experienced as uh, uh, as the virtue behavior? Yeah? The fact is that when you follow through the book and when you are in tune with these formulas, you know he did not react and so on. Greater Greater saga is full of them. In fact, in action, whenever really tested, greater keeps his temper. My wife says, you know, it's much greater feat for someone tempestuous to keep their temper than someone who is tame in, in nature anyway. Yeah? So it's interesting that, that this prevalence throughout the corpus is here enhanced. Here the contrast between, between uh, uh, tempestuousness and keeping one's temper is summed up into one person, in concise, in one person, okay? And you can imagine Iceland is being animated by that, okay? And there is a scene 
in which I can't, don't have time for that. But there is a, I, I don't know where, where am I with time. There is a scene in which uh, 15 minutes, 15 minutes left. Uh, don't bother to have to. <gasps> right. Okay. The only thing I didn't tell you about is the theory. <laughs> okay. So, what was the? Uh, how come that? Uh, um, uh, uh, yes. So we you, you find out that there is, there is a scene in which he actually loses his temper. Okay. So you find a scene. Yes. You know, finally he actually loses it. We were promised all along, you know. But magic was involved yeah? in a, such a pr profound way. I can't obviously go into much of the time into it. A masterpiece of writing. Okay, how they managed to. Okay, so first they focused attention on this contrast between losing and not losing temper. Okay, from the corpus into one person, one saga, and then they focused it further to burning attention on one scene. And this one scene, the filter researchers, the people who study these sagas for decades, didn't know what to make of it. It's interesting that if you imagine that you are making up your mind about Greco, okay? And if you follow through decades the, uh, uh, what these researchers thought of him, if you look through the literature, you see that it's not like a like a like fashion, like swinging of fashion, like a pendulum. Okay, my wife and I call it the hermeneutic pendulum, uh, where you know uh, 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 critics thought that yes, he deserved his bad luck. You know, he became an outlaw and all that. So he deserved his bad luck, um, and and then because of his lack of uh, uh, temper, uh, ability to keep his temper, and then uh, uh, other uh, theoreticians thought. Uh, Later, no, he he actually uh, is celebrated in this saga for his ability to to withstand uh, uh, um, heroically his bad luck. Okay, so and it was swinging from those extreme to extreme across the case. You know, the the theory I want to talk to you about enables you to think in this following way. Suppose that this narrative, this story, is propping propping your understanding of where Gretel stands. Like, like you're pushing him this way and pushing him that way. Yes, he's, it's his fault. No, he's heroic. Well, you know, he, he can keep the temper, he can't. You know. It very carefully, narrative balances out Gretel. The whole, the, the fact that, 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 uh, uh, that this great tradition of scholar, scholarly uh, engagement with this text Shows the pendulum with swinging with Sarvanas is the success of the text. This is not call for us to decide whether Gretel is one or the other. Just think how many examples of that there are uh, 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 in other kinds of literature, in other, in other kinds of art. Yeah? And I'll sh show some examples later. Imagine he was like a needle. And, and if you let go of it, it depends on how you, how you balanced it. If it's leaning more this way, it will topple that way. If you lean it more that way, it will topple that way. Okay, and you will decide accordingly. Interestingly, the more precisely you balance the needle, the more ambiguous it becomes which way it will topple. This is an interesting coincidence that fascinates artists throughout ages. The coincidence of precision and ambiguity. Another way of thinking about it is, I like this, that in English, also in my uh, mother tongue, uh, uh, marbles stands for brains. And uh, imagine dropping a marble, okay? And imagine you're dropping it in a bowl, okay? And no matter you, where you drop it in a bowl, the, the marble will roll around and eventually settle at the bottom of it, okay? Scientists call this an attractor. The center of the bowl attracts the behavior of the system so that it settles there in the long term. If you turn, off, turn the, the, the ball upside down and then drop the ball on top, then if you aim exactly at the, at the center of the ball, you don't know which way it, it will roll. If you drop many times, it will roll, roll in different directions. For, from your point of view, you're dropping in the same, in the same place, but the minuscule, uh, 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 minuscule uh, errors you're making 
are causing you to go this way or that. Let me just see one second. Yeah. Well, I go there. Um, now, imagine that a certain circumstance causes you to behave in a certain way. Imagine that your that you can describe and you can that you can describe attitudes and norms that are at play in your person uh, that, de that determine your behavior, that, that you can describe it as this landscape. Okay? And then imagine that this, this marble is where, for example, narrative places the setup of the story. Yeah? This is not, narrative says that's where this, that's what the situation is. What's gonna happen next? Well, the landscape idea, which is used by scientists to describe uh, uh, dynamic systems, uh, uses the idea of gravity so, uh, as, as a metaphor for what it, how the uh, system will evolve. So the marker will roll around the landscape and settle in some place. Where it settles, you can think of that as a decision that your, your mind makes about how to think about something. Okay? Now, if in this example, you can see that if you if you throw the marble like, somewhere in the center, it is fairly obvious a whole range of different places where you throw a marble will still end up in that center. Yeah? But it is far from obvious what will happen if you, if you throw it at this top of this, uh, of this um, hill there. Yeah? This is the inverted ball thing. Yeah? Then that is an unstable place. Okay? Now, think what that means in terms of the norms and, and, and attitudes that uh, govern people's behavior. That means that when circumstances are such, some circumstances, particular circumstances, then it is not clear what you're going to do. That's alarming. Yeah? Now, it's not alarming if this circumstance is aliens coming to invade. Because you do not expect that will happen. Okay? But if this is uh, a moment in marriage where you start living together and finally things the, the chemistry changes completely. What if that circumstance is that? That's something you can expect in your lifetime. Yeah? In fact, that sort of situation is almost not your fault. You were taught this landscape. How did you get this landscape? Yeah? That represents norms and, and attitudes. You were taught that. You, you learn them from your environment. It is to your great best interest that as fast as you can, you learn uh, 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 those norms and attitudes. This is your chance to react appropriately given different situations. Yeah? If you do not, in the extreme, you're a bad man, a mentally ill person. Okay? So it is of great interest to all of us. From childhood, we get great satisfaction from acting appropriately. But that means many different things in different circumstances. Yeah? This came just, uh, just in September uh, 2014 in the Frontiers in Human Neuroscience. So, Barrett uh, here says For any level of human behavior that can be described as a dynamic system, the stabilities or preferred states of that system, its attractive landscape, are at least analogous to habits should be considered as such. I wanted to show you this so that just so that, 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 that we know what we are talking about, some intuition about the way brains work. This is a simulation, digital simulation, one of the most expensive, probably the most expensive digital simulation um, uh, that uh, I think this is European uh, research something, a blue brain project. And I think, uh, uh, and um, IBM. So this is uh, two millimeters very realistically modeled from actual measurements, okay? Uh, and how they activate, how they connect, and how the uh, excitation propagates during them. I can't, I don't have time to go into this, but uh, you can sort of appreciate uh, aesthetically the kind of behavior that 
goes on right now in every two millimeters of your cortex. And we now know that this is surprisingly successful, success, successful um, simulation. Actually, the, the, the creators of it mean, that worked uh, in many countries uh, for some years, uh, they, were, they were surprised how well this model the actual behavior. This is not blue brain project, this is my little program. But it might be good to show something. So this is a tiny little brain that has four neurons at the moment. It might have five. Uh, it's not really a brain, it's a population of brains. And uh, that evolves over time. And they're trying to learn the green dots. Okay. For all the for all the inputs on the horizontal axis they need to produce these red dots and they're trying to produce them for all those inputs exactly as the green dots are. Yeah. And then mercilessly kill all the children of these networks that do not perform well. And I keep only the ones that perform well and then they are allowed to have children. Now here uh, it's almost uh, finished. So this is 170, 180th generation. And you see that it's sort of learned, yeah? Can you, can you see that it's, it's learning a science function? Yeah. Science function. It learned science function. This, this network, in some way, let me say it and then I'll need to correct myself, represents a science function, yeah? At the top, you see that, like, it's genes. The values that define uniquely this network. Okay, if I know those numbers, I can always re recreate this network. Here's another one. Here it's learning a different pattern. Oh, it's so struggling. This is like a child who's trying to, to, to sing out something. It's better than that. Yeah. And again, it learns. Okay, not perfectly, but it learns. And in some way, it can be said, again, I'll correct myself very quickly, that this network represents that pattern. It knows that pattern, it recognizes or produces that pattern. No, knows that pattern. And uh, the pink is an input neuron, the yellow is an output neuron, the red lines are negative influences, blue lines are positive influences, the thicker they are, the bigger the influence. Very simple. That this picture is designed so that there is nothing hidden from your view. You see everything. That's not normally what you, you know, see when you study brain. You see everything. There is no mystery ever. Yeah? And I have to finish this. Five minutes. Oh, I'm nowhere near. And uh, I never managed to tell this story <laughs> to the end. Okay? So, so, but this is, I'm going to continue. So how, how far I got to get, because this is a really important point. I want you to be critical of what I just said. I said that this represents that shape. Yeah? In a way, it does, scientists would be happy with that. Okay? In fact, uh, so, but something is missing. What is missing is this is absolutely nothing. This is just some numbers. Yeah? That I here represented with red and blue. Okay? If I put the right numbers and I read the, the output numbers in just the right way and I plot them that way and then I, I the human, interpret the result and I say this number, this uh, network learned absolute function, then yes, it represents. But I added some big things to it. I did environment. Yeah? How would you know what it does? If I didn't ask you those questions, we'll come back to that. I'm going to ask you questions that you didn't see before. Here's one. That this is a picture. This is not a video. So uh, it learned. It's also science. Yeah, it's also science. It, this represents in some way. Again, I'm going to like correct myself. It represents science function. Actually, for some decades now, scientists call that distributed representation. But it's a trick. It's not a representation at all. It's not
not any, it's not, it's not like there was a presentation and it got this scattered. It's not at all like that. It's just a completely different way of thinking about I'm not even sure. It's very difficult to say. Okay, so, uh, so in some way it represents sinus function, but I only asked five questions. Can you see there are five dots? I only asked those questions. Now I'm evil. I'm going to ask it more questions than I trained it for. Surprise! This is what it was, and I thought it learned sinus. I asked questions in between, and it turns it. What on earth did it learn? Those are the same spot, the points that on, on those five places, they're the same. But now I see what it learned. In a sense, it learned something different. Yeah? Moreover, the answer to the middle question, like what are you at zero, is very unstable answer. Just a little bit move the number just a little bit positive and the answer will be very positive. Just a little negative and the answer will be very negative. Not proportional as I hoped or, or as was the target. This is to show that we are really interested in stability. Okay? Of a specific sort. From the childhood we are trying to learn to learn the, the norms and attitudes that are in our environment. We need to rehearse them continuously, but our learning depends on having enough to go on. Our learning has to get enough experience so that we get all parts of the landscape. Okay? So we have to get, in order to, to sculpt with our body and our brain and other kinds of things that I can't go into, that in order to sculpt this, the, our experience has to be rich enough so that it can sculpt all the parts of the landscape. S sometimes that's easy, okay? Child every day rehearses mom, dad, yeah? Some practices, you get lots of marbles from those, but some are difficult to practice. Some are too expensive to joke with. They're not good for learning. You need to know them the first time you meet them. If you see a snake, you don't want to learn about how a snake can bite you. Yeah? So how do you give the child enough marbles? And humans have a phenomenal solution. Can somebody come? You come. <laughs> Stories. Simulate. Art. I'm going to give you lots of marbles because that's how you get the chance to sculpt it, and we're going to do it together. It's not good just showing Mona Lisa or whatever, yeah? You're going to see me how I see it. You're going to see me reacting to it. You're going to see me jumping of joy while watching a, 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 a football match, you know? I will feel me disgusted with some political speech. You will feel me uh, when I argue with your mother, yeah? I'm giving you lots of marbles and some of the most phenomenal marbles, some of the most ancient, wisest marbles, most tested, are traditional stories and traditional art. Okay? So we are very interested in stability. On the level of the child learning, we have this issue that the child wants to, needs to get enough of the marbles. But the same problem exists for the community as well. Community is always the child with respect to its future. Yeah? How is the community to learn about what, whether the norms and attitudes of today are, will be worth, uh, whether the world that pr produced by such norms will be worth living in tomorrow? Yeah? Is the world of our attitudes and norms today worth living in? How do you find out? I only have a very limited set of experiences myself. Yeah, but I can watch Game of Thrones. Ah, yeah, yeah, I'm over here. So, nature, uh, you, you tell me what you want to talk about. So, nature's fickle nature and cultures too. There's something really strange about complex systems, okay? They exhibit really odd behavior. And in 1987, the Telegraph 
wrote, tomorrow it's going to be an unsettled autumnal look. And you probably already know what happened the next day. Good afternoon to you. Earlier on today, apparently a woman around the BBC said she heard that there was a hurricane on the way. Well, if you're watching, don't worry, there isn't. But having said that, actually, the weather will become very windy. But most of the strong winds, incidentally, will be down over Spain and uh, across into France as well. But there's a vicious looking area of low pressure on our doorstep, nevertheless, around about the Brittany area. And I'm laughing, but I shouldn't really, because um, he is now famous for that. Because uh, the next day there was a hurricane and 13 people died and a whole lot of devastation. Okay, they got it wrong. They got it spectacularly wrong. Nowadays they don't get it wrong like that. Something changed since then. It wasn't too long ago. Okay, and you would think, what well, technology changed? Yeah. But what? We already knew by this time, by the 87, is that our technology could not, our ways of collecting data, for example, about what is the state of atmosphere, could not have changed enough for such a dramatic change in the result. So would you, do I need to stop? I think because you've got other and there are other things people have to go to if you want to find Oh, sorry, I, 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 didn't, I didn't know that there is somebody else. Can I have two minutes? Two minutes. Sure, absolutely. Okay. Two minutes to run. Okay, so I won't be able to, to go through all of it. So there was a lovely story about how this was discovered many times again and again. Finally, it dawned on everybody when Lawrence went, Edward Lawrence went to, went to drink a cup of coffee and then came up, came back to his computer. The computer did a healthy thing. So uh, we discovered that some systems show sensitivity to initial conditions. That means that if you know approximately what it's doing now and you know exactly the laws that move it, you do not know approximately what you're going to do in the future. Yeah? That was a big surprise. Yeah? There was a mathematician at the turn of the century that went mad figuring it out. Yeah, come to me. So um, here is Matt Office doing some really neat trick. They take the, uh, the information uh, 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 around the world okay, about the state of the atmosphere. They know the laws of the atmosphere. I'm going to skip a whole bunch now of things. So, so, uh, uh, so they know the laws of atmosphere, okay? So they put the data into the computer, okay? And they run it. Okay, it's a video game, yeah? It's a video game of Earth's atmosphere, okay? And the trick is to fast forward it, okay? So the game needs to outrun the physical world, okay? That's the whole point, so that you can see what's going to happen next, okay? But because of the sensitivity to initial conditions, you don't know how good it is. It could be that you're wildly wrong. Okay? I can't explain that in depth. But so what you do, you run it again and again and again and again. Here, 16 times. Sometimes they try to do it as much as, much as they can, as much power, video power they have. 50 times, I think, at the moment. So they do it again and again and again, and they change something. The thing that they change is nothing to us. That's an interesting thing. Okay? Basically, what they're doing, they're dropping the marble on the landscape of what is called the face portrait of the atmospheric system, they drop the marble, marble on basically the same spot. Imagine you, you know, having you know, some landscape and you drop the marble and you think you're drawing in the same place. Okay? Imagine, for example, you take a picture of a dog and, oh no, a picture of, I don't know, Bruce Lee. And, uh, uh, and you make some changes to it, yeah? But you can't tell that the changes were made. You, you change maybe every pixel of it, but so little that you can't tell. Yeah? So that's what I mean. So they change the picture of the atmosphere by a little, plausibly. They know some rules about it. And then run the system. Because the system is sensitive to initial conditions, it's not nothing that it results. It results in this variation. Okay? And then you ask yourself, how, how many of these futures had a catastrophic event? For example, yeah? this is where 50% or 80% rain on Friday comes from. Okay? They literally look into future 50 or 100 times, and if 80 of those times there's rain on, 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 uh, on Friday, they say there is 80%. Yeah. And, skipping, skipping. So, what results greatly the strong is that you understand that what the narrative is doing is throwing the marble through its various, various kinds of uh, uh, through its different readings, through every mind. Uh, and also through different copies of the same narrative that 
uh, the variation of that same formula, you are dropping the, the marble in basically the same place with slight variation. And you see whether the marble rolls away, whether the system does always the same thing or not. From that, you realize that something is either stable or not. Yeah? If something is involving, for example, uh, that penalty, you want it to be stable. You want to get the right answer every time. You don't want it to depend, for example, on somebody running to bring some paper to some other person who is in zone, yeah? and then the bus didn't come on time. You don't want that to depend on that. Yeah? And yet, that's what films show. And they focus, they're trying to focus, to put the marble exactly with acupuncturists, I have it somewhere, acupuncturist precision. They try to drop the marble right in that spot where the ambiguity is most palpable. That's where also we most uh, more, most interested in. Okay, this should be great. This is a you can imagine fashion like this. Okay, these are my little brains. Actually, I stole it from someone. But uh, but if, if I made the isolation, it would be similar. So uh, my little brains, and if I say, hey, learn science, they move there. If I say, move, learn up, up, uh, absolute, and they move there. You can think of art, artists uh, and fa uh, fashionistas moving with time like that. What's the point of it all? Okay? Well, there is a number. But uh, 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 at the first approximation, uh, uh, there is, in recent times, there is this kind of renewal of interest in ground methods. Okay? This was one example. Uh, another brilliant example is a Coursera course, A Brief History of Humankind by Yuval Noah Harari. Okay? I really hardly re re recommend it to you. Yeah. And after 17 weeks, he tells the story of the humankind. Seriously, literally, okay? From ancient hominids to Ray Kurzweil's civilized. Uh, 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 and he a really seriously brilliant piece of thinking, uh, let alone uh, research and renowned science. And he concludes his, his, uh, his course when we deserve it, when we know the whole history of humankind. He said that the main question that faces humanity today is, I'm almost finished, okay. what do we want to want? Yeah? How do we shape our future? Yeah? Not I, I want to satisfy my needs. What if my needs are not my own? Okay? How, can I, how can I design my needs? And when we buy decaffeinated coffee, that's a little bit of what we're doing. And this precision ambiguity issue is really constant throughout the art. And you here you have a precisely balanced human expression. We are really interested in human expression. Our life depends in many ways, or at least quality of life depends on being able to read other people. And she is an obstacle. This is a modern, more modern version of, uh, of a smile, yeah? But boy, is this ambiguous. Chinese guy is smiling. Who is he smiling? Who is he laughing at? Yeah? This is as rude in China as it is in the West. What does that mean? I want to know. But he's hysterical. Is he is that terrible or, or, or suffering? Is another take of it. Yeah? And this is very well balanced. Maybe not as well as the previous one. Look at that one. What does it mean? I got a marble now, rolling hesitantly. Yeah? And as it does so, it's also carving. It's making. 